Hi, everyone. This is America Adapts, the climate change podcast. Hey, Adapters. Welcome back to another exciting episode. I'm Doug Parsons, your host of America Adapts. In this episode, I am taking you to Madison, Wisconsin for the 2019 National Adaptation Forum. Yes, it's an adaptation palooza. My people, all in one spot. I was at the forum and I interviewed a bunch of folks from all over the country. Some of them I knew, many others were new faces to me. They represented how diverse this sector has become. I also got to chat with some students. I was very encouraged to see quite a few of them there. I want to give a shout out to Anita Van Breda of World Wildlife Fund, who shared an exhibitor's table with me. I had some swag there, and I even had an America Adapts coffee mug giveaway. Congrats to the winners of that giveaway. I hope you're using those mugs at the office. They were in high demand. You know, having a table also gave me a chance to connect with a bunch of my listeners. There was probably no better place in the country than this conference to run into an America Adapts listener. For those of you that I chatted with, thanks again for coming up. It was a real treat to meet you and learn what you're doing in this field of adaptation. Some of you I interviewed for this episode... Okay, I want to jump right into those conversations, and I'll have more of my thoughts about the forum at the end of this episode. Okay, adapters, let's take a journey to Madison, Wisconsin, and meet some of your fellow adapters at the National Adaptation Forum. Hey, adapters, I am back, and I am here with an old friend and the organizer of the National Adaptation Forum, and it's Lara Hansen. Hey, Lara. Hey there. So we are on day two of this. I was hoping to talk to you on day one, but here we are on day two. What's going on with the forum so far? There are 12 sessions concurrently running in every slot. All of them have had great showings in them. Things have worked out well. We were a little anxious coming into this forum because of the federal shutdown in January. It meant that a lot of federal partners had trouble figuring out if and when they could come. Uh, But that all seems to have worked out and we're nearing a thousand people again. So fantastic time here in Madison. Okay, it is kind of exciting how it's grown, and so we have this history now of the form. Walk us a little bit through of topics and themes and ups and downs. Yeah, so the initial forum came out of a working group of 50-some-odd people who all got together on a conference call that my team organized, and it emerged into an event that happened in 2013 in Denver, Colorado. At that time, the real focus in the United States on adaptation had been around natural resource management. A lot of it was coming out of the marine world, moving into the terrestrial world, and that was reflected if you look back on that program. Uh, We had a number of participants come that year who were interested in both uh, human community adaptation as well as the role of climate justice and equity in adaptation. And that led to the 2015 forum, which happened in St. Louis, Missouri, having more of that built environment sense. At which point the people who'd come the first year said, hey, what happened to our forum about natural resource management and its role in all of this? So in 2017, in St. Paul, we made an effort to bring both those pieces together. And then our climate science folks started feeling left out and said, why isn't climate science and the tools that we're creating getting more of a profile? So coming into 2019, we think we've found the sweet spot of all of those different perspectives to try and create a forum that can lead toward all those groups being in the same conversation in order to build the solutions that we need to really get to holistic adaptation. Okay, so maybe explain a bit of the demographics of the people that are here. Where are they coming from? Who are they? Yeah, so we're really happy that we have representatives from all 50 states. And the best part about that is that in past years, we've had to recruit people from some states. So we've uh, two of the three past ones, we've gotten all 50, but it's required literally me personally calling people in target states to get them there. This time, we didn't have to do any of that. We had people from even states where you wouldn't think there was a lot of climate change work going on present here at the forum. And we have a nice distribution of folks from government agencies at the federal, state, and local level, from nonprofit organizations at the national and local level, local community groups. We have a lot of students here this year. One of the nice things about being in Madison is that the University of Wisconsin's right here. So we've got students coming from there. We have some high school students actually from around the country who come uh, with community groups. And we've got academics and government researchers. So I'm sure you think about this. I talked to a a graduate student from MIT, and she came thanks to her advisor being here also, and I'm blanking on the advisor. But she did note that it it is expensive for students to come, and a lot of them are wanting to get into that adaptation professional space. I mean, what 
what's, you know, maybe the next form? What do you think their options are to try to get more of those students here? Yeah. So one of the things that we have tried to do at every forum is provide travel support to 30% of participants so that we can up the numbers of participants in, in air, from groups that couldn't traditionally come themselves or wouldn't know that you could come to a conference like this. And that's included students. Those funds are hard to come by. We were not able to come up with 30% of the funding this year because our largest funder of the forum who used to fund the majority of the travel support has stepped away. Several other funders wonderfully stepped up. So we upped the, the, the number we started out with. But that's one of the things we've been, we were focused on for the past several months was increasing that pool. And hopefully we could find some funding source that specifically was targeted at students because it's, it's hard to pick what it is we're going to prioritize in that. Do we prioritize missing geographies? Do we prioritize missing sectors? Do we prioritize uh, low income community groups that would never have the chance at having the resources? Whereas some universities actually do have funds to get students to professional conferences. We've tried to keep the student price for the forum lower than other prices, and it actually has the smallest increases in sort of the ramp up of rates as you get closer to the event. But unfortunately, we can't make it free for them unless we have a funding source to back that up. The forum basically covers its costs. That well, doesn't basically. The forum covers its costs, and that is it. No one is making money off of the National Adaptation Forum. So I have a lot of... Uh student listeners and yeah, I think they'd be very interested in in coming to this and it occurs to me that I don't think you do this or maybe it's something you've thought about it's like sometimes you go to these conferences and there's sort of like these kind of job fair activities or you can hook up students with potential employers at least there's sort of the mentorship because these guys are they're looking at adaptation jobs but they're not quite sure what they are yeah so we tried to do two things on that this year uh so molly johnson and my team started this early career professional group that did some meetings in the run-up to the forum and we have a poster session downstairs that which we give an award for student posters and we have a lot of sessions that actually have student presenters in them and we offer the volunteer opportunity so if a student wants to come to the forum they can get their entry fee waived the registration fee waived if they volunteer which means half of the time you're here, you're volunteering in sessions. We try to let people pick the sessions they want to do that in so that they're actually getting to get all the sessions that they want to, but they do have to give back a little bit to the forum so that they make sure it's a good experience for everyone. I've been interviewing folks and everyone just, you know, loves coming to these events. It's very, it's all pretty much positive, but the only sort of one area where people are kind of saying there's not enough of a corporate presence. And I know we had this conversation, I think the last forum, What's the process of you trying to recruit in that area? It's hard. So breaking into finding people who work in the corporate sector is difficult. Their websites are more opaque than the NGO and academic and government community. It's hard to just go to target company that you think should be here and find people to engage. There are several people who've actually historically come to the forum and now moved into more private sector corporate areas. And I'm actually working with them to try and encourage that. And every time we get a new lead and we follow up on it and we've slowly increased the number of participants, the business sector has in fact been increasing, but it's hard. Yeah. I want to see like the Goldman Sachs guys running the hallways and hooking up with people and being sources of funding. And that's tough. Well, and in some ways, I think that they're apprehensive about coming because of that. I think that they're worried about being seen as a target for funding. Um, this is actually one of the first years we've gotten one of the foundations who funds in the adaptation space to have a booth at the National Adaptation Forum. Thank you, Kresge Foundation. And they're having dialogue with people. I'm certain people are hitting them up for money while they're here. But good for them for becoming part of the conversation. But that could, in fact, be part of the challenge. I interviewed Hugh from Kresge. He'll be part of this episode. So that's great that they're here. Thank you so much, Laura. Super excited. The closing plenary is going to be awesome. Hip Hop Caucus is here. Hip Hop Caucus. Hi there. I'm Hugh McDermott. I'm a communications officer with the Kresge Foundation, and uh, I work, uh, among other duties, with their environment program. Okay, so why is Kresge Foundation here at the National Adaptation Forum? Well, the Kresge Foundation is a sponsor, uh, one of the sponsors of the Adaptation Forum, and uh, it's right up our alley. Kresge Foundation's environment program aims to bring, expand opportunity for people in low-income communities in American cities, and specifically the the environment program is dedicated to climate resilience, which we define as uh, climate mitigation, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, climate adaptation, preparing for the worst effects of climate change, with especially with an equity lens, making sure that low-income communities are both uh, protected as they 
they should be and that they um, enjoy the benefits of clean energy and some of the other benefits of, of the work toward adapting to climate change. And the third leg of that stool is social cohesion, trying to knit communities together, power them to make uh, their own decisions and have a seat at the table when uh, city planners or city councils make decisions about infrastructure or uh, other things that affect them. Okay, is there just one example of a project that you funded to kind of give people a sense of like really an on-the-ground example? Well, it's hard to pick one. We fund uh, dozens, maybe hundreds of projects um, and in communities across the United States. We try to let the communities tell us how they want to best accomplish the goals that we set out for them. And, and because every community context is different, we are funding. Uh, I'll give you an example. One of the things that we're just starting on is we're going through the applications for our climate health and equity program, which combines our, our environments and our health programs. And we want community nonprofits to pull together diverse partners in their cities and create a plan that both uh, helps protect the communities from climate change and can demonstrate improved health outcomes. So we're, we're really excited to see um, what the communities come up with and we're going through those applications right now. So adaptation really is a growing field and this form has grown over the years and yet it's a severely underfunded area, government sort of tiptoeing around it. And in the foundation space, Kresge is one of the few that actually fund adaptation. Is there, why is that? Why aren't more people kind of jumping in? It's really just becoming a big issue. Mm -hmm. I think we've seen more people jumping in. I mean, obviously, you know, the federal government is not in a place right now where it's being very aggressive about protecting uh, Americans from climate change. But we imagine that pendulum will swing. I think that more and more people are realizing or seeing the effects of climate change in their communities and in their lives. And it's beginning to happen on a scale that people can grasp their hands around. So we hope that the, uh, the incredible folks who are doing such good work here and all these organizations are kind of laying the groundwork so that when, uh, when the pendulum does swing and the government and the nonprofits and communities are all aligned toward, you know, making better places to live and protecting ourselves from some of the damages that will be re- ready to roll. Okay. If so- someone wants to learn more about Kresge and the work that you're doing and even maybe long term potentially getting a grant through what you guys do, uh, what would you recommend to them? Yeah. Sure. We don't accept sort of, uh, the environment program doesn't accept open grants. Like you can't just come up with a proposal and send it to us and hope for the best. We, we sort of offer requests for proposals and those are on our website and our funding opportunities page when they arise. Uh, we also promote them on social media, Twitter and Facebook. And you can sign up at, at kresge.org for our once a week newsletter and all of our funding opportunities, uh, uh, go through the newsletter. And a lot of our partners here at the Adaptation Forum, K, the Cake Knowledge Exchange and some of the other places have forums where all those funding opportunities are also posted. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Hey, Adapters. I am back at the forum with... Angela Wong. And where are you coming from? I'm at MIT. I'm in the Master's in City Planning Program. Okay. So what are you really focusing on as part of your studies? I'm understanding how to use planning tools and incorporating a climate resilience lens into that. Not a lot of students actually make it here to the forum. Why did you prioritize coming? Yeah, it's been really great to see all the different people that I've been reading about in terms of the, their academic or scientific work and also their, their their work as practitioners. And so I've been really excited to meet with a lot of the people that are doing really great work in terms of adaptation. So do you have an advisor at MIT? Is, is she or he here? Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's Professor Janelle Knox-Hayes. She's in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning working on climate change adaptation in terms of understanding how people value, what their values are, and also doing a research project on relocation. So what exactly are you studying, though? What's your focus area? Yeah, I'm looking at different ways that you can use urban development and incorporate climate change adaptation into it and continue to develop cities in a resilient way. So are are you almost done or do you have a lot more school left? I, I'm graduating in June, so I have a few more weeks of thesis left. <laughs> so that, that this is exciting though, what's next? So do you see yourself becoming an adaptation professional? Are you going to go back to school, academia? I mean, what, what's the plan? Not sure if I have enough enough uh, motivation to go back to school again, but I'm definitely conti- I'm definitely planning on continuing to be an adaptation professional. But uh, are you already into job search mode? Anything kind of popping up? Figuring out my options. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you're a good test case of like, okay, you know, you're MIT, you're doing some really important work. And so I mean, it'd be curious how it works out for you. So are there any sort of blind spots at the forum? Like, are you like, oh, I wish they were talking about this or that? 
Hmm. No, I think that's a good question. I think there's the forum has been really comprehensive so far, and I've really enjoyed how there's been a range of different topics. And um, I think a really good example is a session that I sat in on earlier today on incorporating equity into infrastructure, which are two very separate topics, but I think it's really important to think about the two. Okay, thank you so much. Great, thank you. Hey, doctors, we are back at the forum, and I am with... Christy Tabai. Where are you coming from? Northeast Ohio. And so what do you do there? (laughs) Um, I'm a consultant currently. I'm also a part-time student, and climate change is my hop. Climate change adaptation is my hobby. Is this your first forum, or have you been to the previous one? This is my first one. Okay, so what are your impressions? I can't believe how many people are here. It's pretty incredible. 900-something people. It's kind of hard to believe they're all scattered about and running into people. More than once doesn't happen often. I mean, there's so much here, but, you know, between the um, poster session, the tables, the workshops, the sessions, there's so much information. There's so much incredible knowledge in this building. So what sort of work related to adaptation are you doing? And are you connecting with, are there anybody in sort of your networks in your field here? So from a professional perspective, yes, but I, my professional work focuses internationally. So I have connected with a handful of people here that are focused on international work. But of course, this is subject matter here is around the US. And that I'm doing a lot of that work through my graduate program. And I haven't connected with anyone from Ohio per se, but I have met a lot of people with that are doing great work in subject areas that I'm really interested in, mostly community engagement and getting people to talk about climate change adaptation. Okay, so any standout presentations or panels? Yes, but I don't remember what the names are. There was one on RAD. Of course, I remembered that because RAD is a great word, but it actually means something. Resist... Adapt, and I forget what the D mean stands for, but it has, <laughs> but it has to do with what type of conservation in terms of biological conservation, what kind of conservation strategies are people using to either kind of go with the flow or to kind of change how we're doing conservation um, in light of climate change. So that was really interesting. The best thing to come out of that was. We can't plan like it's the Holocene because we've really entered in the into the Anthropocene. But we're still planning like we're in the Holocene. It's interesting. Any others? So I've been a volunteer, and I've attended sessions that I normally wouldn't have picked. So there was one yesterday on South Carolina, work that's being done in Charleston. Had no idea that they had issues with earthquakes big earthquake in the late 1800s. But also now they have issues, big issues with flooding. Uh, And they've done a lot of work. The Sea Grant has done a lot of work around working with communities to identify what kind of adaptation needs to happen, um, even within neighborhoods. And that varies from neighborhood to neighborhood. Um, And I, there were so many parts of that that I found interesting that I wouldn't have even considered because I wouldn't have walked into that session. Okay, so what about some areas that they're lacking? Any topics, any sort of areas that you feel like they should include in the form? <laughs> okay, this is going to seem like it was planned, but communication. And maybe I've missed it because I haven't, because I've been a volunteer and assigned to certain rooms. Um, but, and there are sessions about communication, but I don't know if it's really been explored broadly enough. So, in terms of film, in terms of podcasts, in terms of um, any other type of media. Again, I know there was one or two sessions, but I don't really recall kind of something being an intentional tract given how much we communicate with people about this topic. I think it's it's, the communication wasn't sort of ramping up to the level that it sort of deserves. I think it's more very situational that some of the panels and such we're doing. It's, it seems like to be, it's a cross cutting rather than I think it needs some dedicated sessions. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Hey, Adapters, I'm here back at the forum, and I am with Jesse Keenan at Harvard University Graduate School of Design. 
You guys know Jesse well. He's been on podcast a couple times. So why are you here, Jesse? I'm here supporting my colleagues from the federal government, USGCRP and EPA, and thinking about and learning about how NCA4, the National Climate Assessment, getting feedback and, and presenting some of the work and participating in that. If it's possible, can you distill down what you were saying in the climate finance panel? Yeah, I just want people to understand that there's, of course, discipline necessary analytically. There's trade-offs. Resilience and adaptation are not absolute goods. We have to think about trade-offs, conflicts, synergies. You know, adaptation is, uh, it comes with costs and benefits. There's winners and losers. And we have to think in even distributional terms about who are the beneficiaries and who pays for what. That has an equity implication, but it has a very fundamental uh, impetus for economics and finance. So is this your first forum, though? It is my first forum. I've been a little bit reluctant to come. I actually don't think they've been particularly receptive to my ideas, uh, perhaps, in the past. But uh, it's good to see people doing applied work, and I have a lot to learn in that regard. What were some of those ideas? Well, some of my ideas, again, are driven by about making investments, about thinking critically about a lot of the rhetoric that we've been pushing forward. Because at the end of the day, we have to make hardcore investments. We have to determine, perhaps even through democratic processes, about what to protect, what to let go. And that's not easy. And I think it runs a front of a lot of the rhetoric that everything we're doing is great and resilience is amazing, but it's not. I've been asking what are some of the blind spots for the forum and like the lack of sort of corporate business presence here. And it's like, I think, 8% of the people. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? I think the forum is doing a lot in terms of diversifying participation and themes. Every climate change event around the world always complains that we're the insurance people, we're the bankers, and that's a perennial challenge. But I think hopefully in the future we'll be able to get um, not just the finance and banking world, but think about other economic sectors, transportation, agriculture, etc., and have them paired with scientists, social scientists, scholars, practitioners, advocates, and the like, and really think through some of these difficult problems. I'm seeing a lot more University of Florida people here than University of Georgia. Why is that? Uh, well, I think Florida with IFAS has a tremendous ag extension. They have a network and really are doing amazing work. But at the end of the day, you know, the University of Georgia uh, is uh, a far superior uh, athletic program and uh, as well as a better school overall. And sometimes I think that it's better off if, if we stick to our peer institutions at Oxford and the like and it's, uh, we don't always have time to come to things like this. So, Thank you, Jesse, for coming on. Yeah, Doug, thanks so much for having me. Emily Wasley. So where are you coming from? Oakland, California. And I am a climate resilience and risk specialist and a personal resilience advocate. So you and I actually go way back a ways, right? So what were you doing prior to this? Prior to the work that I'm doing at Cadmus, I was at the U.S. Global Change and Research Program, working as the Adaptation Science Program Lead in Washington, D.C. Emily, I'm just going to give this little plug. It has always been the most positive individual I've dealt with in the adaptation universe, and so I don't know how you do it, but thank you. It's, you've been a nice friend over the years. You're welcome. It's, it's, it's in me to be optimistic. It's not always possible, but I do practice a lot of self-care and reach out to support networks and folks so that I don't feel like I'm doing this on my own, because I'm not. So you've been a regular at the National Adaptation Forum for a while, but why do you come here? Why is there value to this? I come here because these are my people. I'm an adaptation professional. I have some of my best friends that are also adaptation professionals. I feel connected to the people that are doing this work. I can learn about new things that are happening on the ground. I can share resources that I'm working on, projects that I'm involved in, can form new partnerships. It's really where I get to connect with the people that I love and that I work with. Um, I also get to connect with some of the ladies of adaptation. We always do a after session, after conference girls trip. So that's always fun to look forward to. I know about this. It's so clickish. You're just excluding us all. It's so mean. Any women are welcome. Men can join, but not for sleepovers. <laughs> Yeah, the wife would not be happy with that. Okay, so any sort of things missing from the forum? Like, it's a, you've been going, I think you've been to all of them. And so it's obviously growing, but are there still blind spots with it? Oh, absolutely. I, I think, you know, with every conference, there's always room for, for improvement. And I think we tend to get into this realm of talking to each other. And we try our best to talk to other people outside of the adaptation field. But I think more folks that are interested in climate change that don't work with it on a day-to-day -day basis, we should reach out to and should be attending. We, I think, you know, having some sessions in the communities such as Madison, 
so that people can, we can go to them instead of us just saying, come to this convention center and come and chat with us about hard issues. And I think the equity issue is being addressed more so now than it has been in the past, but I think there's always room for improvement there. And I think just the, the transition to what do we, how do we make this transformational shift to adapting to becoming more resilient to climate change in the face of so many other stressors that we're facing? Okay, so I just sat in on a session that you led. Could you just really quickly describe what was it all about? Sure. So it was a session on personal resilience on the adaptive mind project. It was pretty much focused on the challenges that adaptation professionals such as myself and you face when we know the projections that have been provided by top scientists. We know what's coming. We're planning for what's coming. We're trying our best, but we're constantly running into barriers and political challenges and lack of resources and funding, and sometimes lack of just acknowledgement of the issue. And so how do we support each other through that process while also helping others in the communities within which we work and live? So I spoke a little bit about my own personal resilience story. Other folks shared some of theirs. We talked a little bit about challenges, resources, what's keeping people up at night. And then Susie Moser and Kristen talked about the Adaptive Mind project that they're working on. I've been peripherally involved, but, and that's all about understanding what are the resources that adaptation professionals need in order to adapt to the devastating loss of nature and the environment that we're facing and how to cope with that. Just so this isn't a complete love fest, I had some issues with this session. I think it's more about my personality and you had a really clever way of like people could put words up on the screen and the audience could contribute. And it was really a standing room only. It was a full house. And I saw words like grief and, you know, challenges. And I just, oh, I just, it rubs me the wrong way that I get the bigger issue of climate change is depressing, but I'm excited by adaptation. And like the p- fact that people are just depressed about it, I just, I, I can't relate to it. And so I felt like the flip side of that is like, you know, I would, I, I've said something, but the whole point of like taking, I mean, we're adaptation f- professionals in this new emerging field. It's a once in a life time opportunity to influence something that's so exciting that's great and yet i felt like the session was more like people are like oh i'm burnt out well and i think there are you know different people are challenged with different things and we have to acknowledge that and i think being excited about the opportunities that we have i too share that but there needs to be a space for people who do feel the loss of nature and the loss of environment and to make sure that they don't feel alone. Um, and there are a lot of people at this conference that are in this work because they want to protect the beauty of nature um, and the ecosystems that are providing us with life. And, you know, they, we need to provide them a safe place to be able to do that and to share that. And you may be more resilient than others. Um, you may be able to process things a little bit differently, but everyone's different. Just like adaptation, there's no one size fits all solution. But just being able to talk about it is really helping people process what's happening. I like to tell the story. I went down in Australia last year. I was invited to speak. And at the end of it, someone asked me, um, how do I get up each day? How do I approach this? Why aren't you depressed? And a lot of the same issues. And I, I'm up there and, and I, my first response is, I guess I'm just shallow. And, you know, got a big laugh and I, I, there's probably some truth to it. So, um, you're right. There's all types, but. Well, I wouldn't say that you're shallow, Doug. I mean, give yourself some credit. I think, (laughs) I think, you know, it's all your perspective and it's all how you view the world and it's all how you view challenges. You can turn them into opportunities. I tend to do that as well because I'm an optimist and. I always see silver linings in any sort of terrible situation, unfortunately, but fortunately. And so you may do the same. And I think that's wonderful. And I think it's a gift that you have. And you should be grateful for that. Not everyone gets that. Curse. And I think we both agree that I, the podcast itself, you meet me in person, cynical, jaded, but the podcast, I hopefully is optimistic and inspirational. And that's what I hear a lot from my listeners. Oh, absolutely. I listen to your podcast every time I run the lake in Oakland and it just gives me so much hope and so much knowledge about what's happening in the adaptation field, what are the challenges, what are people doing, who's doing new research. It's just, it's wonderful. I love it. Thank you. 
You're welcome. Thank you. Hey, Adapters. I am back at the forum, and I am with... Lynette Rangel. Okay, this is very exciting for me. Lynette came up to me and introduced herself and said she was a listener. I'm always just delighted to meet you guys, so thanks for coming up. Yeah, absolutely. It's my pleasure. I saw your booth yesterday while I was here cruising around the forum and had to come up and say hello and introduce myself if I got the chance. So awesome. And you also mentioned that you are here at this forum because of listening to the podcast. And what do you mean by that? Yeah, so I started tuning into America Adapts about six months ago or so and have listened to a number of episodes and I heard you speak about them or speak about the forum during one of your podcasts and I got really intrigued because I'm just now gaining more exposure into the climate adaptation space and I thought it would be a great opportunity to network and also learn about and be inspired by all of the incredible folks that are working in this field. So a lot of the people here are professionals. So as a student, are you finding the forum valuable? Yeah, I absolutely am. I I find it valuable because it's giving me ideas of potential directions I can take my career once I graduate. Okay, so what are some potential avenues? Yeah, I've definitely been looking into the idea of going into potentially wildfire mitigation and management as I hope to return to the Lake Tahoe Basin. That's where I worked previously for the California State Forestry and Fire Department. So going back there, but in a bigger way would be amazing or potentially going into climate policy, maybe working in Sacramento or another policy space where I can really advance climate policy in a much bigger and quicker way because the reality of our climate crisis, I think, really calls for that. And lastly, I don't know, I think I may or may not consider running for a local political office in the future. And so I think just gaining these ideas is really great to think more holistically and broadly on like how I could potentially collaborate as an elected official in the future with somebody else. So Duke obviously has a great reputation, but I've never really heard much about adaptation at the school. Is it, do they have programmatic work or are there, there's, I mean, what's going on there? Yeah, great question. To be honest with you, I don't think that there is a lot of adaptation going on within the Nicholas school or the school of the environment. And it's funny because just the other day we received a survey in our email inboxes from the student body saying, we need suggestions for new classes to be offered here at the Nick school. And I am going to respond to that email by suggesting like climate adaptation and planning classes, because I think that that is a realm of environmental work that a lot of students are craving, but it is largely absent right now, at least to my understanding. Sounds like you guys need to invite me down to give a lecture on the need for this. Okay, so are there any blind spots at this forum? Are there areas you're like, gosh, I wish they were doing more of this? That's a good question. I am not sure, and I don't feel like I can speak well to that only because I am new to this space, so I don't really know what may or may not be missing. I guess one thing that stands out, I'm aware that the mayor of Imperial Beach is here, which I think is really incredible, but I do think that there's maybe a lack of elected officials in this space, and that may be really valuable in the future to have at another forum um, in two years from now more elected officials, politicians here speaking, because I do think that there needs to be the collaboration in that space in a much bigger way. Great observation. Well, thanks for coming on and thanks for being a listener. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. My name is Patrick Marchman. I'm mitigation champion with Resilience Action Partners. Okay, so why are you here at the National Adaptation Forum? I'm here to connect with uh, other adaptation and resilience professionals. It's uh, been an amazing opportunity and um, yeah, I'm uh, really grateful to be here. Okay, so any presentations, speakers stood out for you so far? We're only on day two here, but anything? The last one, the the Adaptive Mind presentation with Susie Moser and Emily Wasley really, really was great so far. Why did you think it was great? I think it was great to get beyond like discussions of parts per million and technical stuff. We've heard of all that a million times before, but actually getting to the human side for professionals, I mean, it's really essential. It was good. It was good. I asked that because I didn't actually like it. And, you know, I just felt like there was so much introspection and so much dwelling and grief. And it's just, oh, I just can't relate to it. And so, I mean, I get it. It's valuable that way, but I don't know. I just feel like 
you know, this is an exciting thing we're doing. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. I think it's incredibly exciting, and there's a lot of introspection and grief too, and that's part of what makes it exciting. It's you know, it really engages the whole human person, and I, you know, I'm I, again, you know, it, it's just really good to see all these sort of perspectives, you know, and all this. Uh, I, everyone looking from grief to excitement to worry. It's it's nice. Okay, so you're from Kansas City, and you, I don't really hear a lot about adaptation in Kansas City. What's what's happening there? I'm not from Kansas City, but I'm there. But there's uh, Kansas City, from my understanding, you know, we don't work directly with the city, but there's a lot of green infrastructure stuff. They're really forward thinking. But you know, we're just really more more focused on hazard mitigation in that part of the Midwest right now. And I'm hoping to get a lot of more consideration on future conditions work. You know, to actually start looking forward beyond the next beyond the hazard mitigation plan horizon of five years. Okay, help people visualize, though. You say hazard mitigation, but what does that mean? That's a, sort of a FEMA term of art, which is basically just trying to reduce the damage, you know, to disasters. In the Midwest, in the upper Midwest, it's generally uh, flooding is probably 95% of it, but there's also tornadoes and things like that. And so mitigation is all about trying to make those um, disasters hurt less. Okay, so what about the form? Is there anything you feel like it's missing that would be beneficial to you? Long-term stuff. The you know, I, I know we're all focused as professionals. We have to think, you know, what's in front of us. But I think, you know, actually looking fifty to hundred years and such in terms of what climate change is going to bring, and you know, I, I think that would be something nice to think about. That gets more philosophical, but still, I think it's uh, an essential part of the puzzle. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Hey, adapters! I hope you're enjoying these conversations. What a great, diverse, talented set of people working on climate adaptation. Before we jump back into those conversations at the forum, I wanted to share a message from one of my longtime listeners. Hey, adapters! My name is Christy Tabai, and just like you, I'm a loyal listener of the podcast. I've been listening for about two years now, and after the first 15 episodes or so, I decided to take the leap and donate. I wanted to support the hard work that's going into each episode, and I really valued the conversations taking place. My work focuses on helping communities cope and adapt to the impacts of climate change globally, but I really wanted to do more locally. America Adapts has really helped me to better understand the issues here in the U.S., as well as what's working and what's not working. If you find value in these discussions, I encourage you to head on over to americaadapts.org click support, and donate. You can be a recurring donor like me. I give $5 a month. That's $60 a year. Or you can make a one-time contribution by credit card or check. Many thanks in advance for your support. Thanks, Christy, for sharing that message and for sharing how the podcast has been a resource to you. Christy has been one of those folks who randomly reached out to me after she found the podcast, and she's become a treasured colleague. Christy, I hope other listeners are inspired by your words and make that leap to support the podcast. Folks, I stay afloat through listeners like you. There is no big pot of money keeping me doing this full time. Donating is very simple and recurring donations are even better. Visit the website at americadaps.org and look for the donate button or look in the show notes for this episode and you'll see that donate information. Okay, some exciting news. I have a new intern. Welcome, Madeline Zeef. I think I got that last name right, Maddie. Maddie just started a couple weeks ago. Maddie is a student at the University of British Columbia, but actually is an American. She's based in New York for the summer, but she's going to be doing all sorts of really useful things for me. I'm very excited about this. First up, we're going to be sharing some audiograms, which are just going to be smaller sound bites from the podcast. And Maddie has already teed up five of those. I'll be sharing those really soon. Welcome to America Adapts, Maddie. I've mentioned before, and I will be mentioning in every podcast, we have this resource, Podcasts in the Classroom. So if you're interested in using America Adapts in your classroom for students or even professional workshops, check it out. It's being led by Kate Bishop-Williams at the University of Waterloo. Basically, each episode, Kate and a small team listen to my most recent episode, then develop discussion guides that will be available in the show notes. So my last episode, Keeping History Above Water, they developed these super cool show notes where they're actually help you structure a town hall meeting based on like you sort of take the role of all the people that I interviewed in St. Augustine. It's really cool. I'll check it out. And so I want to give a shout out to Kate for leading and thanking the team for their efforts. And thanks to Sarah Hansen, who leads the Open Courseware Education <laughs> Educator Initiative and her colleagues, Peter Chipman and Alicia Frankie, who are digital publication specialists at MIT Open Courseware. Thank you guys for being part of this. They have been instrumental in this podcast in the classroom initiative. 
These guys have been a great resource for educators, and we are so excited to see them developing to better suit the needs of all sorts of educators. And so if you are actually using these, please reach out to me. I'd love to hear how you're actually using the the resources in your classroom. Okay. Also, if your organization is interested in partnering on a specific podcast, let me know. There are so many stories to tell on this emerging issue. Let's see if we can collaborate on a future episode, sort of like I did with the University of Florida and Flagler College with that Keeping History Above Water episode. I mentioned before, Adaptation Canada 2020 is in Vancouver next year. Let's partner on a Canadian episode. So reach out on that. Also, if you're interested in having me speak at a public or corporate event, please reach out. I've been doing some keynote presentations and they are so much fun. I share stories from the podcast and my own experiences in adaptation. I will talk about adaptation in ways that will motivate and inspire you and give you some insight on how this sector is really growing and evolving. You can contact me via the website americadapts.org. So upcoming episodes, I'm headed to New York to do an urban forestry episode sponsored by American Forest. I'll be interviewing folks from the Parks Conservancy of New York, the U.S. Forest Service, and other experts in the area. I'll be moving all around the city in New York doing these interviews. I'm super excited about this. So yes, America Daps is in the big apple. I'm also interviewing the CEO of Grist Magazine, longtime environmental news shop. And we're going to be digging into the Green New Deal. And also I'm going to be doing a special bonus episode where longtime listeners of America Daps share their thoughts about this podcast. That should be out soon. Okay, let's journey back to Madison and hear from the rest of the adapters. Hey, Adapters, I'm back at the forum, and I am with... Dr. Amber Paris from the Climate Science Alliance and the Center for Climate Change Impacts and Adaptation at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Holy cow, that was a lot. All right, so what do you guys do? (laughs) So we're really a boundary-spanning organization that's working really hard to bring together our community to translate and disseminate science and get it into the hands of people who need it and really um, engage our community on these very tough topics. All right, so I'm going to be up front here. I, you've heard me talk with people I know here, and I know Amber very well. We go way back, but the work she's doing in, um, in Southern California, very innovative with the partner development. So maybe you could expand on that. Yeah, the whole vision behind creating the alliance was to be able to create a space where we could bring together researchers with scientists, with artists, with educators, with NGOs, with foundations. It's all about creating a space to come together as a community to advance resilience. And we do that by creating these partnerships with researchers. So they're not just someone in the ivory tower. They actually are someone who are embedded in our community and helping to inform decisions that are happening locally. But the real heart of what we do is our community engagement and we do a lot of work with artists and matching artists with scientists and really helping leverage art to touch people in their hearts and not just their minds. Another big piece of that is our youth engagement. So using art, storytelling, and science to teach kids about climate change in a way that's not scary. And so that's what our Climate Kids program is all about. Why doesn't the Alliance have their own podcast yet? Because we love you and we prefer to listen to America adapts than do this ourselves. (laughs) Don't patronize me. Okay, so you have a history here with the forum. You you go back. You've been part of this process. Could you, you give a little bit about that? Tell me your history with the forum. Sure. I've been part of the forum since its first initial inception, and the thought was really to create a place where people who are working on adaptation could come together. At a time, it was very isolating. Scientists and climate scientists really focused on their own meetings, and folks who are really looking at translating that work and getting it on the ground were kind of isolated. So the forum was really created out of this need to be able to create a network and a space for adaptation practitioners to come together and to really look at how we learn from each other and leverage each other's projects and to really advance work on the ground. I think that this has really evolved and we can see by just the sheer number of people here how important this topic is and that we continue to evolve as an organization or really as practitioners to continue really advancing the work and not get stuck in planning and process and really get this these actions on the ground in a meaningful way. Okay, so you have a long history with this forum here. I've been asking people, like, it's obviously a great event for them, networking, the sessions and such, but what are, what are some of the blind spots? What's, what's kind of missing? One of the things that I think is missing is that now that we have created this network for practitioners to come together and now with the growth of these regional forums, we have really created that solid group of people who are working on adaptation, but we are still missing key components of that. And one place I really feel is missing is really having climate scientists here. I don't know if we need to infiltrate AGU, but we need to make sure that climate scientists really understand our needs and that we're playing these really critical roles in disseminating and translating science, but the scientists need to be also hearing what communities need and that they can become a more active part of the community. I'm curious because this is only every two years and a lot of us are frustrated. It takes that long for us to get back together again. A lot of conferences are every year. Do you think it's a subject yet that deserves an annual conference? 
I don't think it deserves an annual conference merits an annual conference because of the regional conferences that are happening. So there's a lot of important things that happen when we come together at this national scale in learning. But with adaptation, actions are really local. And we need to be able to have these regional and very more localized forms also to really advance actions on the ground that are meaningful in the place where we're trying to do them. So we have dune restoration project in Puerto Rico. We have a dune restoration project in California. We're working with partners on a dune restoration project in Mexico. And all of those approaches are are different. And we are learning from those, but they're not the same. And so I think that it's really important that we have these forums also a place for those that they can be hyper local, and that we also have the chance to come together on a national scale. And there's so much work to be done, we can't spend all of our time in meetings. Amen. Oh, any, any sort of resources you could direct my listeners to if, to learn more about what you're doing? Uh, please check out climatesciencealliance.org or our climatekids.org websites for more. We're all about being a resource to the community, whether that's local, national, or global. We're here to be part of the solution and to support other entities who are thinking about this. So contact us and we're happy to help. Well, maybe we'll collaborate on a podcast at some point in the future. I love that idea, as long as you do all the hard work. And you pay. All right. Thank you, Amber, for coming on. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Hey, Adapters, we are back at the forum, and I am with... Rich Bunnell. Okay, Rich, where are you coming from? I, um, I live in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I used to live in California, but I moved here about... or moved there about five years ago. And I, I current, I'm currently contracting with the American Society of Adaptation Professionals, who I know have come up on this podcast before. Is this your first forum? The first time I worked with ASAP, actually, was to help them organize the 2016 Great Lakes Adaptation Forum. So I have a so I went to that one, and I also went to the one in 2018. But this is my first one of this size, for for sure. So what, what are your impressions? Have any panels or presentations that have stood out for you? Oh, well, I went to, I went to a really great one yesterday uh, that was specifically about communicating climate change in America's, uh, in like South Central U.S., which is, which is to say Texas, Oklahoma, New Mexico, and just, uh, and the challenges of communicating there in an area where you can't say uh, climate change. And just, uh, I, I find... I work in communications. Uh, that's just kind of been my thing. I used to be a, uh, I used to be a copy editor and designer for a few newspapers in the Bay Area, and just the way climate change is communicated is really just fascinating and important to me. Okay, so any sort of blind spots for the forum that you're like, gosh, I wish there was more of this. Well, being in Madison, there was a little too much cheese at the lunch sessions. <laughs> But that's the first time I'll ever complain about that. Uh, I don't really have any other forums to compare it to is the thing. Uh, this one, uh, I'm really pleased with how this one turned out. So can you sort of contrast it with maybe the regional forum? I guess maybe size and scope and things that were talked about? Yeah, in terms of size and scope, yeah, this one dwarfs the, the Great, Great Lakes Adaptation Forum by something like a factor of 20 to 1. <laughs> I would say just the fact, just the venue is enormous. And I would say in terms of coverage and sectors that are covered, it's a, it's, it's very similar. NAF is really just like kind of the other regional four I've been to just kind of blown up. What about the sort of demographic makeup? Were you able to kind of tell were there more kind of corporate interests at the regional one or did you, were you able to determine that? I, I I'm saying, honestly, I'm seeing a lot of the same people uh, uh, that I saw, that I saw at the previous two. And I would say, I haven't done a demographic breakdown, but it seems to be about the same to me. Okay, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Nice to talk to you. Hi, I'm Rebecca Esselman with the Huron River Watershed Council. Uh, adapters, you probably recognize that name. One of my very first guests on America Adapts was Rebecca, and here we are again at the National Adaptation Forum. So it's great to see you, Rebecca. It's really great to be here. This is my fourth forum, and I just keep coming back for more. Okay, so why? Why do you come to the National Adaptation Forum? There is, um, you know, the colleagues here give me a lot of energy to go back to my office, a lot of ideas to run back with, too, to think about work in my spot on the map. I'm the only climate person at my organization, and so it's really great to convene with so many people, so many brilliant people across the country, and learn from the efforts uh, that they're doing in their spot on the map. So any presentations or, you know, panels have stood out for you? You know, I went to a session this morning on personal resilience, which um, is very different than the typical session at NAF. I didn't know what to make of it. I knew one of the moderators. She said, 
you need to be there. So I was like, okay, I'll be there. And I was really impressed with what happened in that session. And it was just a conversation and an acknowledgement about the weight that a lot of climate professionals carry in their day-to-day work and kind of the impact that has on both our work life and our home life and our personal well-being. And it was just kind of a nice, uh, different look at what we do and how we need to care for ourselves to, in order to be able to keep doing the work we're doing and do it in a way that's sustainable and healthy. So I talked to Emily Wasley. She, I think she's probably the person who invited you, and I brought up that personal resilience, and I did not like it, and I, I gave her an earful about that, and so it'll be part of this episode. And I, yeah, I just, the, the language of grief and just this, I just felt adaptation is this incredible opportunity. It's a very exciting time, and I don't know. I just, I, the room felt like, gosh, are people really just strung out? And it, it, I don't know. I And I told Emily that I'm probably just really shallow, and she had very positive things to say about me, which I, she probably doesn't know me well enough. But, uh, yeah, it just it rubbed me the wrong way. You know, words like grief, that's not something that I experience on a day-to-day in the adaptation field. But I do have to work to maintain uh, or to kind of settle anxiety. Um, and I feel like the more I read and the more I learn, there's this anxiety about the unknown. But I agree that... You know, coming to convenings like this and seeing, you know, I've, I've, this, as I mentioned, this is my fourth. I've watched this thing grow and I just see all of us shoulder to shoulder tackling this and it is exciting and it is hopeful. And, you know, I don't want to spend too much time in that space of anxiety or grief about what's coming and, and our potential fate and focus more on solutions. But it's also what, you know, what that session did for me was give us space to acknowledge that that's part of this as well. And, and it's an okay part of it. I feel like you're a hopeful person because I, I, maybe I don't have this right, but I feel like after every national adaptation forum, there's a new child in your life. (laughs) I got to keep the army growing, right? (laughs) Okay, this is a question. You and I are graduates of the Institute of Ecology at the University of Georgia. Great, fantastic program doing cutting-edge work. Where the hell are these people? Where are all those UGA people doing amazing work? Why don't they see the relevance of adaptation and coming here? They're academics. They're working at nonprofits. Where are they? Yeah, it's you, me, and Ned Gardner, right? Yeah. That's a good question, and I think we need to reach out to the little alumni network and see if we can't recruit some some additional folks. I don't know where they are. Hopefully not in academic institutions, just talking to themselves. <laughs> Seth Winger, we're talking about you, you wiener. Okay, so any blind spots for the, the forum? You feel like, okay, you've been to going to all of these now, but is there still an area where you like, they need to do more? Where the forum needs to do more? Uh, you know, I've watched the forum evolve with kind of the the topical areas that are covered and I think they're doing a great job at responding to the field and kind of the new frontiers in adaptation. I can't name a blind spot. They actually think of more content areas than than I have, so they're kind of helping me with my blind spots. Laura Hansen, you hear that? You pay her off. Okay, thank you so much, Rebecca. It's great seeing you. <laughs> Likewise, Doug. Rowan Hamden. Where are you coming from, Rowan? I'm the CEO of XDI, the Cross-Dependency Initiative. I'm here from Australia looking at uh, climate resilience for infrastructure. Okay, so Australia is quite far. What made you come all the way to Madison, Wisconsin to this forum? What really stood out for you that it was worth your time? So the National Adaptation Forum seems like it's the most well-put-together climate change event in the USA. I've been here twice now, and both times it feels like uh, there's the right group of practitioners and... Uh, people trying to make a difference despite the federal political climate and there's a lot of activity and even the the jump from this last conference to this conference you know, there's probably another 30 percent more people here so you can see there's actually a growing sector in the country is there anything equivalent in australia like a national adaptation conference anything uh there used to be but we, we just had our last one and our last funded one so we're uncertain whether there's going to be any future climate change conferences of this nature in Australia, depending on the outcome of the federal election. That's pretty depressing. I, <laughs> I know that it's at the volatile nature. We, we run and actually we chatted before when I was in Victoria, and so he's here now, so it's great to catch up that way. Um, any sort of presentations or themes that have stood out for you here? 
Uh, look, our focus is very much on infrastructure resilience. So it's been good. There's actually a lot of good practice going on uh, in different cities and communities around the country, which you'd expect in a country this size. And so I feel quite encouraged by how far a number of communities have come along and their sophistication in understanding the complexity of the problem and how to deal with it. So a lot of good practice is emerging, particularly so I saw a good presentation yesterday from New York where they'd been working with business owners uh, to protect them from flood risk and it was very pragmatic solutions that suited the business owners and suited the community. Anything that's missing here? Any sort of like topics? Yeah, look, uh, I feel like we're one of the only few private companies here as almost literally no investors. It's quite an unusual conference for me. Like there's almost no corporate involvement. I, I'm aware like uh, we're competing with other, I mean, so some of the other people who would have joined us here at the conference are actually going to other financing conferences in other parts of the country and in Canada today. So there's other work going on. It's just not part of this community. Would you say at the Australian events there was a much bigger corporate presence? Uh, it was definitely bigger. It just still wasn't big. And a lot of the discussions around uh, the capital flows and financing these products and actually making a difference, real investment difference, uh, happening in other forums. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sebastian Malter. Okay, so where are you coming from? So I spent most of my life in international development. I was working with the German Agency for International Development in projects in Southeast Asia and South America, doing mainly working on water projects and climate change adaptation projects before I moved to the States about four years ago. Okay, so what brought you to the Adaptation Forum besides sort of the obvious reason? What really, how did you justify coming here? I'm an active member of the American Society of Adaptation Professionals, and I'm involved in some of the activities, including the member-led groups. And one of my main interests is how can you actually effectively mainstream climate change information into planning processes and decision-making processes. And ASAP provided a great platform to discuss these topics and talk to peers and other practitioners. And I suppose that was my main motivation to come here. You and I sort of have a little bit of brainstorm of this group you're leading, um, institutionalizing adaptation within organizations, and you can describe that better. And so that group just started. Maybe you could give a little bit of background, and are you still accepting members? We're still accepting members, and actually there is still an opportunity for one, one or two leaders to join the leadership team. And the main purpose of this group, or I guess how this uh, idea came up, was the first IPCC report was uh, established in, or published in 1990, I believe. And over the last few decades, we made the climate science community made a lot of progress on developing tools and climate science information, which we can use in any, you know, adaptation planning. But problem is, despite having all this information now available, I feel like people are still not able to effectively go from planning to implementation. And I feel like a lot of the challenges people are having now is more of an institutional sociological nature. Okay, and so this is oh, it's been a sort of a pet passion of mine for years is like institutionalizing adaptation. It's not sexy, you know, but it's so important because you, you got to get it embedded. And I think that's what you're trying to do there. And yeah, so I want to put a plug. If you're out there, you should uh, consider joining Sebastian's group. I think he's looking for a co-leader, but yeah, keep it up. This forum though, uh, what sort of stood out? Any presentations, any topics? So yesterday I went actually to a quite interesting topic where they were talking about nature-based solutions on for coastal resilience. And I'm more of a water person. I'm in the water sector. And what I realized when comparing my profession with transportation professionals, one of the drivers which might drive or which help to drive climate adaptation are regulatory drivers. And the Federal Highway Administration or the Federal Government put actually out some legislation where transportation infrastructure has to consider resiliency. I mean, I was surprised that they are a little bit further, farther than the water sector because we don't really have a regulatory environment yet, which should require water utilities to consider resiliency or nat natural hazards. Okay, so what, is there anything missing here? Do you feel like, okay, they're missing this topic, they're missing something here? Well, it's only a second day. I still want to look for other topics. So I'm, I have an open mind. I still have to kind of wait one more day to, to find out what's missing. <laughs>
<laughs> nice, safe answer. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lisa Craig. I'm with the Craig Group. I'm a private consultant, and I work on resilience in historic coastal communities. Okay, so we're at the National Adaptation Forum. You're, I'm actually here at your table. So why did you decide to do a, a booth? I think it was important for the private sector, for consultants who have had experience working in local government or with private property redevelopment, to get out there and help other organizations and owners and adaptation specialists learn more about how to deal with existing buildings that are in high-risk flooding areas. The private sector really is just a small part of this forum, and I think that some people, you know, that needs to change a bit. I mean, what, what are your thoughts on that? I absolutely think it needs to change because that's where the funding is. That's where the expertise experience is. Uh, Local government, state government can only go so far. They tend to focus primarily on publicly owned structures or infrastructure issues. And I think every single property owner has to understand that it's their responsibility. It's their investment that they need to protect now, 30 years from now. And it's up to them to make a difference, to to adapt their buildings, to adapt their sites to future conditions and the increasing flood risk. You know, I I, I know the organizers and I know they bust their butt to get a diverse set here. But you just you would hope like the insurance companies and the banks, they'd be wandering these halls and they're not here. I think that's where the private sector comes in. I think you've got to use individuals, firms uh, like myself, like some of the other uh, larger um, environmental and engineering firms that are here to make those contacts because we've done workshops. We've worked with uh, realtors and insurance lenders, brokers, um, worked with all of those people who are developers who are the ones that need to go out and get the financing and buy the properties and make sure that they're meeting the regulatory requirements. There's a little bit here about building codes, but we need building code officials here because that's really where the rubber meets the road when it comes to requiring adaptation in communities that are at risk. So I really think this is what we in the private sector need to do more uh, to promote with the National Adaptation Forum, giving them the access and contacts and information that matters. Okay, this is only day two of the the forum, but any sort of panels or presentations that have stood out for you? I think that as I've been observing what is being presented, I'm really looking more for the serious adaptation strategies, the practical approach. There's a lot of great information here um, that's not just about flooding issues, but about wildfires, uh, heat islands, dealing with all of those things that are um, uh, climate change uh, concerns. What I'm concerned about is an adaptation forum. I really want to see more practical adaptation methods. We all understand the science um, to a certain degree. We're learning more and more about it every single day. And all it's really reinforcing with us is a sense of urgency. And I think that we need to see more focus at this particular forum on practical adaptation strategies that can be adopted that are good investments for the private sector and doable for local government. There's so much in planning. It's been going on for years, and I think what you're getting at is an on-the-ground adaptation examples, and do you think there's just enough of that out there to kind of share? I think that it's starting. I think that there are some best case practices that are out there, and I tend to see them at some of the smaller smaller regional forums. So uh, I know you're going to be at the Keeping History Above Water St. Augustine. We've got uh, a lot of adaptation best practices there. We're still talking about the issue, and I think that's critical um, to be able to communicate this to the general public um, and even within our professions why adaptation is important, for example, for those of us who manage cultural resources. But at the same time, I think that um, Georgetown Climate Center, I think that there are entities that are out there trying to pull together these best practices, but we just are not doing as good a job as we can to get them into the hands of the people who have the ability to implement them. Hey, Adapters, we are back at the forum and I am with Deanna Moran from Conservation Law Foundation. Elena Mahali, also Conservation Law Foundation. You guys probably recognize those names. Previous guests, most recently talking about some legal issues, and they are here at the forum. So is this your first forum? Yes, it is. So what do you think? Uh, I think it's been great. There's been a lot of really interesting sessions, and there's a really good cross-section of professionals here that actually don't even all do adaptation work normally. Yeah, it's been fantastic. I think doing this work, it's important to be able to inoculate yourself with a recharge every now and then. And that's happened for me at this conference. 
in our podcast, we, we were talking about the subject that you've been talking a lot about lately, and that's what your panel was about, right? Yeah, yeah. We had another panel here on adaptation liability and how governments and private actors need to be aware of how they could be on the hook for not planning to adapt, but also not fear litigation when they're trying to be proactive and do the right thing to adapt. Okay, so it was sort of somewhat of a workshop. Have you learned anything? So you've been working on this issue for a while, but have you taken anything away, anything new with these participants in the process? Yeah, we didn't have um, as much time as we would have liked to kind of break out into groups with some of the participants and talk through some of the issues that they're seeing. But we did do that a little bit. And it was definitely interesting for me to hear kind of new issues surface. I was telling Elena earlier today, one of the questions that someone asked me was whether or not a government would have the obligation to rebuild an area that had been completely destroyed by extreme weather. And the example that came up was Paradise, California, which obviously was ravaged by wildfire recently. And I didn't know the answer to to that question. And Elena and I talked a lot about it uh, earlier this morning, but it's a good question about whether or not if there's no remaining real estate, if the if the government is obligated to rebuild in that same spot. And if organizers read between the lines, 8 a.m. starts are not good. (laughs) <laughs> also, no snacks in the afternoon. Harsh. <laughs> but did you have anything you learned new with this process, though? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I really appreciate how much folks at this conference writ large were working in equity issues and thinking about how the issue, whatever it is that we're talking about, is impacting low-income, minority, marginalized populations. And so I appreciated the the equity lens that some people brought up in our panel. Like going back to Paradise, that was a community that had a ma- majority elderly and disabled people. And, you know, thinking through the evacuation plan that that community had or didn't have came up as something that I really hadn't thought about with regard to that catastrophe. I guess you know one of the shortcomings that have come up, people enjoy this form a lot, but it's a lack of sort of the corporate presence, but also got me thinking, talking to you two, is that there's really not much in the way of lawyers here either, you know? And I don't know if it needs to be more regulatory, but why aren't more lawyers taking an interest in this subject? And I'll start with you, Elena, because you, you are the lawyer. <laughs> you know, I think I personally appreciated that more so than any other profession, there were not lawyers. Like I get, I get all the time to- that I want to spend with lawyers. My organization, CLF, is predominantly lawyers. So it's actually really helpful to... This morning, I sat next to a social worker. And, you know, on my right was a climate scientist. And personally, I think that I was carrying the torch as the lawyer, communicating a lot to a lot of cross-sector different people. And I appreciated that. So this isn't necessarily, I think, the place where I would spread the message to other lawyers. But there are other forum for that. For a... For I... (laughs) <laughs> and I, I guess I didn't mean so you could share your hatred of other lawyers. It's 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 more of when you have a lot of lawyers somewhere, you start really taking things seriously. And I think it just would mean the coming of oh. age of the topic versus your natural animosity toward like, your fellow lawyers. Like maybe people would take take the issue of liability more seriously if there were more than than <laughs> just one or two lawyers. I you know I think that. I don't necessarily agree that numbers is, will necess- will wake people up more to the liability threat. And I think the message that we really tried to convey, too, was one of don't be afraid of getting sued. And sometimes the more lawyers you have in uh, an area, the more elevated that sca- fear of getting sued when we want people to be doing the right thing and, and you know, passing land use regulations that they're not fearful that they're going to get sued for taking private property. And actually, there was an update just yesterday. So our panel was yesterday. And one of the cases I talk about is this city of Virginia Beach, which is trying to do the right thing. They denied a zoning amendment to a developer who wanted to build in a really hazardous area. And they denied it and the developer sued them. And all these eyes were watching this case because it was like, oh, can the city do the right thing? And just yesterday, a judge ruled that the city can contemplate sea level rise in their decisions to deny a zoning permit. Even if it's not already built into city codes and regulations, which is the really important part because part of the claim was that like they had done this ad hoc and they hadn't gone through like this formal transparent process of laying out the reasons for why they were considering sea level rise and how they would consider it. And so the fact that they can take that into consideration without having to formalize it in code or regulation is really, I think, important. Yeah, I mean, I was just at a panel where Suji Mosher, who's amazing, was talking about the tension between giving people enough fear that they 
there's an urgency, but also handing them hope and saying, but there's a way through and there's something that you can do. And so we try to instill that in our workshop too, of sort of saying, here's the liability threat, but here's your path forward. And that case coming down yesterday was really nice affirmation of the power that cities do have to, to do right in the face of climate change. Okay, last question, Deanna, I want you to take this. Is there any area that is sort of missing as you kind of look at the form, even though this is your first form, are there sort of sectors of society that you would like to see at the, the National Adaptation Forum? Mm, that's a good question. I don't know that I would say that there's no, but there is a sector not here that should be here, but I think that there could be greater representation of some of the sectors that are here. Like Elena mentioned this morning, we were in a, a workshop and one of the participants was a social worker and she when introduced herself. She said, I don't, I don't do climate adaptation work, but I do social work and I'm starting to see how extreme weather impacts my clients. And so I came here to learn more about it. Um, it's those kind of people that I think we want to see more at events like this because there's the people like Elena and I and a bunch of others who do this day in and day out and are like really kind of like wonky in the weeds about it. But then there are people who, I mean, this is going to touch every sector. And there are people who don't think of themselves as adaptation professionals that might not think to come to a conference like this, but I think it's really valuable to have their voice. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, I was joking on the podcast that I thought you guys might secretly hate each other, but I, I'm sensing you seem uh, you seem generally like you like each other. So I just want to report back to my listeners that it, it's, it's all good. So thank you for coming on. <laughs> thank you for having us. Thanks so much for being here. Okay, Adapters, that is a wrap. Thanks to everyone who participated in this episode. I hope you all can see we're in good hands with this amazing group of people. Many of you weren't there in person, but I hope through this episode, you feel like you were there in spirit and you got a sense of the presentations and the people in attendance. Maybe it'll inspire you to attend the next forum, or maybe even just go to one of the regional forums they have in the off years. Thanks to the organizers for sponsoring my travel. I'm truly grateful for that. They make a major effort to subsidize travel for a lot of the participants, which obviously helps ensure a diverse audience at the forum. Okay, some final thoughts on the forum. I promised I'd share some. The forum is really the premier event for people in the adaptation space. That's great, but this sector is growing. We need to see a lot more people coming to these events. You heard over and over in my conversations, where were the private corporations? Where are the big private funders? You're seeing a lot of this in Europe, but I think we're missing a big opportunity not getting all of this together at an event like the Forum. So if you're a private company and you're listening to this, put the Forum on your map. You need to be there and you need to encourage other people in your networks to be there. There were some great presentations spanning a variety of themes. I encourage you to take a look at the program. It's still available online. And even though it's after the fact, you might find a topic and a speaker that you're interested in and probably want to follow up with us. So please do. But an area that I felt was lacking was communication. There were probably a dozen communication presentations, but nothing really looking at the big picture. How are we going to explain this issue to the broader society? Most of it was sort of toolkit kind of communication practices. And I think I'll use a poor analogy here, but it's sort of, you can't see the forest through the trees. We saw a lot of trees there. As you guys know, I struggle figuring out what is the perfect adaptation elevator speech. So how do we get the public behind what we're doing here? I didn't see that bigger approach at the forum. Think bigger, folks. Okay, some other observations. They had a hip-hop caucus presenting at the very end. That the new mayor of Madison, Wisconsin joined that event. In a very odd moment, I realized the mayor and I did field research together in a remote f- station in Costa Rica nearly 20 years ago. I went up to her and she vaguely remembered me when we chatted. But I was very encouraged that someone with a PhD in ecology is now the mayor of a city. How cool is that? This is purely a Doug moment, but I can't leave it alone. I have to say something. (laughs) The entire event was vegetarian. Breakfasts, lunches, you name it, all vegetarian. No, I am not a vegetarian. I get the intention, but next time, I guess I'll need to bring a bag of jerky to hold me over. All right, that's my only bitching like that. Okay, so there you go. I hope you enjoyed your podcast journey to the National Adaptation Forum. Congrats to the organizers for hosting another successful event. It keeps growing. It needs to grow a lot more but it has a lot of smart people making it succeed. And it was a real thrill to meet so many of my listeners. I still love that moment when they say they listen to the podcast. It is truly an honor hearing that from someone. You know, I was having breakfast with with a couple of people and I was chatting. And when I got up, someone actually came up to me and asked if I was Doug Parsons. They had overheard my voice at the next table and recognized me. That's so cool. All right. Some final housekeeping. Don't forget to join the Facebook page and the Facebook community group. The group is private, but just search for America Daps and ask to join and I'll prove you right away. We have been having some killer conversations on there lately. And I'm not just hyping that. Just we're digging into like 
issues around the Great Lakes, talking about climate deniers and their role and sort of challenging climate science. And there's really just a lot of great conversations taken off there. So uh, join, join the Facebook community group. And on that note, I love hearing from you. I mean it. Just say hi. If you have an idea for a guest, let me know. It is the highlight of my week hearing from my listeners. And sometimes it really leads to some cool things. It does. I'm doing this Letters from Adapter series. I need to do another one of those soon. Please consider sending me your own note that I could share. I'm at americadapts at gmail.com. Send me that email. All this information is on the website, americadapts.org. Okay, adapters, keep up the great work. I'll see you next time.